Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah.
want to offer a word of welcome to all of you who are here in the sanctuary today. For, for some of you, it's a matter of, of coming back to this sanctuary after a number of years. For some, it may be your first time here at St. Andrews, uh, but we're very glad to have you here. Uh, given that uh, there was apparently an amber alert sent out uh, just a little while ago, I'm going to suggest if you haven't turned your cell phones off, uh, you do so now and leave them off for the duration of the service. And then on behalf of Bill's family, I also wanted to uh, say welcome to those who've joined us online um, in this year when we cannot get together physically, uh, this at least allows us to share both the gratitude that we have for what Bill brought to our lives, but also the loss that his death creates as the Church of Christ. Part of our calling is to be there to mourn with those who mourn and to rejoice with those who rejoice and we fulfill that calling in coming together in this way today. As we come to worship, we're also reminded that there is another who is with us. Jesus promised that where even two or three gathered in his name, there he would be in the midst of them. And so today we're not only here to remember and to give thanks for Bill, we're, we're also here in the presence of our risen Lord who is here in the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to us and to offer us his hope. So let's join together in prayer. Lord Jesus, our Savior, our shepherd, our friend. In the days when singing could be a part of a service like this, Bill imagined all of us singing the hymn in the garden. A hymn that speaks of the joy that's to be found in your presence and of what it can mean to us to be told that we are your own. And we come to you today in the conviction that Bill was one of your own, that he was, to quote one of the Psalms, one of the people of your pasture, a sheep of your hand. And if, even in our grief, Lord, that gives us real hope. For your hold on us never wavers, your promise never fails. Your word tells us that not even death can separate us from your love. And you promise to walk with us through all of life's dark valleys, even the valley of the shadow of death. And so we turn to you this morning praying that during this time, in the midst of this valley, you would walk with us and talk with us so that we might have no fear, but rather experience all the comfort that you have to give. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Gathering like this, especially with uh, people joining us online is an opportunity to share memories and uh, each of, of Bill's sons has prepared a few words to share with us and Grant you're going to lead off I'll invite you to come forward and do that Thank you, Duncan. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to say a few things about my dad. Uh, remarkable man. You know, I can remember coming here as a kid and um, with uh, 
uh, all of my brothers, and we were uh, put in one pew with my parents at either end uh, to keep us in order, and they, they'd give us the occasional peppermint to keep us quiet and, and things. So brings a lot of memories coming back here again, Duncan. So, um, you know, I remember listening to uh, Wendell's sermons. I, I, I remember Sunday school here, you know. And I, I, I think some of that, you know, it kind of sunk into all five of us. So because I think we turned out okay. So I think that was a good thing. Um, I remember uh, after church, we would uh, head home uh, for lunch. And normally, that was a combination of two of my favorite things. Uh, my mom's baked beans and her famous macaroni and cheese. And occasionally, we would get a treat of fried bologna. After church, Dad would play his records on his hi-fi. He was the first person I ever knew to have one. Um, you know, songs from the Clancy Brothers and James Last would fill the house. You know, I remember him singing and playing the fiddle and dancing with my mom and laughing. You know, church was an important part of our family life when we were kids. But uh, my mom and dad had most to do with how we turned out okay, I think. You know, dad certainly taught us a lot. For instance, he taught us all how to drive a car. And I remember he told me uh, before I had my driving test that he thought I was very, very well prepared for the test. And I think he probably told that to everybody, right? At least all of us. Anyway, during my test, I was caught by the examiner speeding. I backed into a hedge trying to parallel park. And I'm pretty certain I ran over a curb. And I know that Dad didn't teach me any of those things. <laughs> Needless to say, I failed. So when I got home uh, and I told him of my debacle of a driving test, his response was that he was sorry that I didn't pass. And then he asked if I just wanted to go out and practice some more driving to learn about how to avoid curbs and you know, hedges and how to read a speed limit sign. So he didn't complain or voice any disappointment. He just said, let's get back in the saddle, or in this case, get back behind the wheel and keep at it until it's done. Um, for me, that's an important lesson. Tenacity is an important character trait. And my dad had it in spades. I don't recall my dad walking away from anything or any challenge. Over his lifetime, dad faced a number of very serious health issues. He was close to death three times that I'm aware of. But each time he amazed his doctors and his nurses and all of us by pulling through and literally healing himself. That's tenacity. He was fond of saying, you couldn't kill him with an axe. However, age did finally catch up with death, although it took a long, long, long time. Our dad's passing has been a wonderful walk down memory lane for me. I've been spending a lot of time talking with my brothers about my dad. And it's, uh, it's great just to find out things about your parents that you just didn't know. The stories just got better and better, I think. My new favorite story is learning from my brothers that during uh, the time when my dad was working in Brazil, he and my mom would actually meet together in New York City to spend some time together. After all, they were thousands of miles away for long periods of time, and New York City is a pretty romantic place. So I found out that I was conceived in New York City in August of 1957, <laughs> which I thought was pretty, pretty fun. Kind of explains my fondness for the place, I think, and maybe some of the home movies that we have of it, too. So. Our dad was a remarkable man. He lived a remarkable life. He had a great sense of humor. His colorful descriptions of his tools, especially when they weren't working properly, are legendary. He had a large heart, quite literally, and a large loving family. He was a great father, a great grandfather, a great great grandfather, and a great friend to many.
I'm going to miss the old bugger. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. And David? Yes, thanks. <laughs> Take this thing off. Um, I'm David. I'm the number four son of five. Uh, three of us are, are here today. Unfortunately, my other two brothers um, couldn't make it, but they're going to be with Dad soon. In fact, they're already with Dad. Uh, anybody who knows me knows that uh, pretty much every day I wear a suit uh, at least while I'm in the office. But today, I decided, out of respect for my father. <laughs> well done. This, this is his wardrobe, or at least what I remember for as long as I can remember. As you heard from Grant, uh, my dad was a great man. He was a great father, a great grandfather, and a great great-grandfather. He loved his children, he loved his grandchildren, and especially his great-grandchildren, of which he was blessed with many. They were all very special to him. And he loved his grandpuppies too. You see a picture of a couple of them there, but he was blessed with many of those grandpuppies as well. As Grant mentioned, uh, we learned a lot from my father. He, he taught us a lot. Um, I, I, by the way, passed my driving test first go around. Um, but no, he, he, he taught us an, an awful lot. Um, and I can remember, actually back when I was a young lad, I played a lot of soccer. I, I played a lot of soccer. Uh, and so I was uh, traveling all the time to soccer tournaments. and. Most cases, my dad was driving, so we had a lot of time in the car, so we'd have a lot of great chats. And just some of the things that I remember that he's taught me that have stuck with me, anything worth doing is worth doing right. The best ability is reliability. And bananas taste best when their skin is turning slightly brown. I hope that I've been able to impart some of that wisdom to my children, especially the part about the bananas. My dad loved music, and he loved to play music. And he could play pretty much any instrument and play a tune on pretty much any instrument. He was amazing. We used to have many, what I would call, music parties at home, where dad would be playing the fiddle, Don would be playing the piano, and, uh, and other friends of the family would be there playing accordions and, and like drums. It was, I grew up with that, and that's something that I will never, ever forget. Something that you may not know, or I'm sure these two guys know but may have forgotten, my dad loved to whistle, and he was an amazing whistler. Again, I remember on some of those uh, trips to soccer tournaments, or when we used to travel back home to Nova Scotia, we'd have whistling competitions in the car. And none of us could whistle as good as Dad. Dad taught me a lot of other little ditties, uh, things that I will always remember. And I'm going to share one with you now. You two guys have heard it. I know my daughter's heard it many times. It's Mulligan's Cat. Well, it goes like this. Mulligan's cat was eaten fish. Callaghan's dog sat busy at the dish. With one spring, the table he cleared. He quickly put a hole through the tomcat's ear. Catch him, Towser, Callaghan said. Mulligan heard him and kicked him in the head. He jumped to his chest and he said, Take that for sicking your dog onto my tomcat. And that was just one of them. You can imagine driving to a soccer tournament for a few hours and <laughs> having to hear and hear. That's why these things have been ingrained in my head, and I will never forget them. 
Dad could also fix anything. And he refused, in many cases, to actually have someone service things, especially his car. But we relied on Dad because he could fix anything. I remember back when uh, my wife and I were in our, our first home in Pickering. Uh, my son, Sean, was just a baby, and uh, we had no heat. I, I didn't know what the matter. We had an electric furnace, I remember, at the time. Um, I had done everything I could do. I changed the fuses. So what do you do next? You call Dad. Dad came over in the middle of the night, I remember, and uh, it was the middle of the night. Our house had dropped down to almost 45 degrees, so it, we, needed, we needed some heat. And uh, he came down to this electric furnace, took a look at it, looked at the schematics on the inside panel of the furnace and said, this furnace isn't wired right. And then he proceeded to rewire my electric furnace. And guess what? We had heat. That's just the kind of man he was. We're all going to miss my dad. But like, like the lessons he's taught me and the little ditties that he used to sing to me, we'll never forget him. He was a great man. Thanks. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm glad you donned the uniform today. And uh, finally, I'll ask uh, Don to come forward. Glasses on, so I have a fighting chance here. Good morning, all you out there in the in the void. I'm Don. I'm the number one son, and just to put Grant at ease, I failed my first time too. <laughs> in my case, it was because I relied too much on my mirrors, which I must say I did learn from my father. Didn't look over my shoulder enough. So. <sighs> 98 years is a long time to be knocking around this old orb that we call the Earth. I am privileged to say that I shared 73 of those years with my dad. They weren't all good times. We certainly had our father-son conflicts along the way, but I never doubted for one second, his love for me, for my four brothers, and for my mother. Dad was always tinkering with things, as Dave said, he was a, a fixer. He did all his own vehicle maintenance, and I had the enviable job of being the official holder of the light and the tool fetcher when necessary. I remember as a young boy, would have been uh, probably early 50s. Uh, so I would have, well, anyway, you can do the math. Dad was rebuilding the engine on his old 49 Ford. Rebuilt it in the basement and was going to reinstall it in the car. While we were in the basement putting it together, our drop light, which was just a bare light bulb in a socket, and had no protective cage. Somehow the light bulb broke, and I may have dropped it because it was my job. All the broken glass shards fell into the freshly bored cylinders. Needless to say, he wasn't pleased. I never knew there were so many names for a broken light bulb. Other vehicular adventures had Dad racing his 55 Oldsmobile against Stan Hamilton's Pontiac, and here's a name from the past you may or may not recall, Bob Oliver and his Monarch. And the three of them were racing on the 401 highway between London and Woodstock before the highway had opened. They had the road all to themselves. I don't know who won the race, but I know they got back safely and they didn't get caught. 
I must have inherited that love for fast cars. When I told Dad that I was planning to race, race my new, or drag race rather, my newly acquired Corvette at a Corvette club event, he did his best to talk me out of it. He said, it was too hard on the car, you'll break something, you don't want to do that. It fell on deaf ears. When I returned home having won my class, all he could talk about was changing the camshaft and uh, two four-barrel carburetors and whatever we could do to make it go faster. I continued racing for a few years after that, and Dad and I did make several modifications. He would come to the track with me, and he would always have on his shop coat, which I got from, I'm not sure it was Phillips or Conier, but he had the shop coat, and he had the noise concussion headphones on, and he would wander through the pits, and he would help me with my car, but he would also give advice and physical assistance to a lot of the other racers who were there. And he became a fixture around the track. People would go to him, and he just reveled in it, and he made many friends among the, uh, the racing crowd. My strongest recollections, however, involved the music. As Dave indicated, Dad could play pretty much anything. I like to say he could knock a tune out of anything. He played fiddle, accordion, guitar, piano, harmonica, and a variety of wind and brass instruments, including bagpipes, although he seldom played the entire set of pipes because of the wind required to keep the bag inflated. You could often hear him playing the chanter around the house. I like to say my father gave me my music, but he didn't just give it to me. My brothers, Dave and Grant, both play the piano very well. Departed brothers, Bob and Neil, both played guitar and sang. We got all that from my dad. Dad's favorite instrument was the fiddle. And he taught me to play the piano so I could accompany him. I remember entering an old-time fiddle contest one time in London. It was hosted by uh, Gordy Tapp, whose name may ring a bell. He was uh, uh, Uncle Clem on Hee Haw, I believe. He went on to do that. And uh, when we came out on the stage, I remember Gordy made some comment about the size of the accompanist. I think I was 11 at the time. We didn't win, but it was my first gig that didn't involve a kitchen party. Later in life, Dad gave me a piano as a wedding gift because he said he didn't want me leaving home without a piano. It was more likely he wanted me to be able to play with him when he came to visit, which we did regularly. When I started recording with some of the old-time fiddlers, along with Bobby Brown, Dad would come to the rehearsals and he'd record us so we could critique what we were doing before going into the studio. He was an amazing help. In Dad's later years, I would visit him at his retirement residence in Scarborough every week or every week or two, and he would play the harmonica to my piano, and we would entertain the staff and other residents. As it turned out, one of Dad's uh, dining room table mates also played the fiddle and asked to join us, and we had ourselves a little band. Old George Sheldon, as Dad called him. He was a year older than Dad, but he was still old George. He became one of Dad's best friends. Sadly, George moved to Vancouver a year ago to be closer to his family and passed away last May, which was very, very tough on Dad. Dad and I played one more time after George moved, then the pandemic arrived. I miss my jam sessions, but I will always have the memories. I love you, Dad. Godspeed, and rest in peace. One of Dad's requests was to have a tune called The Dark Isle played to send him on his way with your indulgence, I'll see if I can get through it.
Thanks, Don, both for the words and for the music. I want to share with you now a few verses from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, words spoken by Jesus himself. He said, very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to, listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This has been a year that has uh, shattered a lot of expectations including expectations about what a service like this might look like. But it's really come home to me as we've been getting ready for today and especially once we started to gather here in the sanctuary this morning that once we can come back into this place in numbers once again, I'm never going to see Bill sitting right there off to my right with either John Stephen or, or Alf Clausen. Whichever one he was sitting with, the two of them thinking that they were whispering to one another when in fact anybody within a four pew radius could hear what they were saying. This year has changed a lot of things. But one of the things that it hasn't changed, in fact, one of the things that hasn't even touched are the promises of Jesus. Promises like the ones that we heard in that passage from John. And, and this morning, I really just want to focus on one sentence out of that entire passage. Jesus' statement that he came, that his sheep might have life and have it abundantly. Or as some other translations put it, have life in all its fullness. There isn't a great deal to choose between those two translations of the passage. They, they ba both make the point uh, abundant perhaps leans a little more towards the idea of quantity of life, fullness, perhaps a little bit more towards quality of life. But the truth is that, that Bill experienced both of those in full measure. As the obituary that uh, you yourself prepared for him says, Bill lived a remarkable 98 years. There, there you have the quantity of life. And he lived them remarkably well. Quality of life. 
Bill's life was abundant. As some sportscaster would probably say, he put up some pretty impressive numbers. He lived for a remarkable 98 years, was blessed with 55 years of marriage to Charlotte, to Lottie, before she passed away in 2000. Lived in the same house here in Scarborough for 58 years, had five sons, five daughters-in-law, 12 grandchildren, nine great-grandchildren, two great loves. So you can do the math yourselves. Bill's life was certainly abundant. And it was also full. He enjoyed a long and varied career as a project engineer, a career from which he retired twice. He was a man of many varied interests, a competitive pistol shooter, found out for the first time as we were talking about today that he also served as a a kind of official at the 1976 Olympics was an avid traveler visiting Alaska, Australia, Barbados, Brazil, Germany, Mexico, and various spots in the Caribbean. It was while in Brazil for work that he learned to speak Portuguese, a skill that he later put to use in in helping to interpret for the Toronto Police Service. We've heard that, that Bill was a kind of MacGyver, Nothing that he could not fix, uh, that he had a well-developed sense of humor, that he worked to outdo his friends in witticisms, uh, that with those same friends he enjoyed many other activities, curling, lawn bowling, not golf. Not, Not that he didn't golf, he just didn't do it very well. Here at St. Andrews, he served on the board of managers and and the session and and gave of himself in all kinds of other ways over the years. And, of of course, he loved music. Uh, He loved to make music. He loved to hear music. He he, he loved what he called the great old hymns. And he, he always told me on a Sunday morning if I'd picked a winner in his estimation, And he'd gently tell me if he wasn't quite so happy with the selections in a particular service of worship. But music was so much a part of Bill's life that when I looked in my funeral notes file to see if there was anything that he had told me over the years about what he hoped this day would look like, everything that he had ever told me involved the music. The idea that we might be singing that hymn in the garden or that somebody would play the dark island. Uh, One of the other things was that if we could have had a a recessional, he he wanted to go out of the sanctuary with the trumpet voluntary playing. He, He wanted to go out on a note of celebration. And all of those things that made Bill's life both full and abundant are things worthy of celebration. They are a big part of why we're here this morning. We're here to remember them, to give thanks for them. But Jesus' promise to us and to Bill goes far, far beyond that. Even for a 98-year-old, the life that Jesus has promised involves so much more. It goes beyond all of that in terms of fullness because the fullest life you can live is the life that's lived as it was intended. I know Bill had a, a few choice names for some of the wrenches in his toolbox But he nevertheless knew what each one of them was for. He understood their purpose. And God has a purpose for us. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus' promise of life in all its fullness, therefore, is a a promise to help us discover those things that, that God has put us here to do. To help us live out the reason why you and I are here. And here at St. Andrews, we are so grateful that Bill discovered that at least part of that reason for him was to offer his many talents and his his many gifts to us. But Jesus' promise also extends to life's abundance, to the quantity of life that's available to us. Bill's 98 years go way beyond the three score years and ten that are mentioned in Psalm 90. He beat that biblical life expectancy by 28. But Jesus' promise, Jesus' offer to his own is that we will in fact experience life beyond measure. Life beyond numbers. Life beyond counting. In the very next chapter of John's gospel, Jesus fleshes out that promise when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. That is what we are believing for Bill today. And earlier in that same gospel, in chapter 3, Jesus promises that those who believe in him will not perish, but rather will have eternal life. Infinite life. Limitless life. Estimates are that there are something like 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th power stars in our galaxy. And that there are something like 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th power galaxies in the universe. That that means that the number of stars could be something like 10 with, with 24 zeros after it. A million That's six zeros, a billion, nine, a trillion, twelve. This is 24 we're talking about. So that's like a trillion trillions of stars. But even that doesn't approach infinity. Even that doesn't approach eternity. And that's what we are promised. And that's what Bill is promised in Jesus. Endless life and full life. As full as we can imagine. That's what Jesus promises to his own. And that's what he came to bring to those who would recognize him as their good shepherd. As the one who would lay down his life for his sheep. In just a few weeks, we'll remember how he did that for us. But for today, our hope is in the empty tomb that he left behind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father is one old confession put it. Our only comfort in life and in death is that we belong body and soul not to ourselves but to our faithful Savior Jesus Christ. And we thank you today for his promise made manifest in Bill's own life of a life in all its fullness. And we are so grateful that as we let him go this day, that letting, that letting go is not into some, some great unknown, 
but into the embrace of that same Savior who promises a, a life beyond this life, a life in his presence, a life that sin and death can never touch again. Assure us, we pray, that Bill is not simply gone, but gone to you. Father, in this time of remembering, we've also been reminded of how much Bill has meant to us and of the things that made Bill, Bill. We, we thank you for those memories. Memories of, of music and of laughter, of life lessons, of bad golf. And we pray that those memories would remain with us as, as treasured possessions in the days ahead. May that gratitude for what we've had temper the pain of what we've lost so that we are able to speak Bill's name often and with joy. Father, though Bill's passing has left an empty place in this sanctuary, it has even more left an empty place in this family, and so we lift them up to you. We pray for Don and David and Grant. And we pray for their families and, and for the families of Bob and Neil as well. We know how much they all meant to Bill. We pray for Lucy and for the extended family in the Yukon and down east as well. We ask you to minister to them as the source of whatever comfort or strength or peace they might need. And we pray too for those who loved Bill here and who are saying goodbye to one of your own once again. Remind us, we pray, that we do not grieve without hope. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a few moments, we're going to be proceeding to the cemetery for the committal. Uh, for those of you who've been joining us online, I want to say thank you and pray that you would experience the peace of Christ. Uh, for those of us here in the sanctuary, I'd simply ask that you follow the instructions of the funeral directors as we make our way out of the building.